Ukraine is a mess. Don't blame Donald Trump for that. Well, you know, one minute. Ja, wir brauchen die NATO. Wir sind everywhere, from Lithuania to the Sahel, to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to Lebanon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. Hello, I'm Olga Olaker. I'm Hugh Pope. Welcome. In this episode, we're speaking with Alessia Vertanyan. Alessia is, is Crisis Group's analyst for the EU Eastern Neighborhood. What that means is she's one of our top analysts on Caucasus issues. She's based in Tbilisi, and we'll be talking to her today about Nagorno-Karabakh, because we have a new report on that conflict. Alessia, welcome to War and Peace. Hello. This war started in the sense of fighting right as the Soviet Union broke up. Because of the way that the Soviet Union was set up, Azerbaijan when it became a dependent, had a substantial enclave of Armenians, the Gorna Karabakh, populated almost entirely by Armenians, as well as a large Armenian population throughout the country. And Armenia had a lot of Azeris. So, Alisa, how would what would you say brought them to war, brought them to fight each other? Well, grievances ha have been around for quite a long time. There were some tensions going on, and uh, actually the Soviet uh, government made attempts uh, to pacify the population, including in Nagorno-Karabakh itself, but all of that failed. And uh, we would uh, just see the troops on both sides, you know, self-organized uh, groups of people who would learn how to use weaponry in, in the beginning of the 90s. This was definitely not what we see today uh, when we see professional armies. That was probably the reason uh, why the fighting started, uh, when they just the Soviet uh, government at that time did not uh, manage to pacify the populations uh, and the situation on the ground. Hugh, you were there as a journalist. What were your impressions? I got to the front lines as they were being established in in 1990, actually, just before the Soviet Union collapsed. And as as you were saying, the really raw feeling of two societies that had been torn asunder. There were so many empty houses in Baku where Armenians used to live and empty villages in Armenia where Azeri villages used to live. And People still had a very strong memory of this. And as uh, Alessia was pointing out, it was a very amateurish war. And uh, it didn't feel as if it was a, a real armed conflict until much later. I mean, it started off... Uh Yeah, the Soviet Union was still in place when this war starts, but it continues well after the Soviet Union collapses. And when there's no longer power in Moscow that, in theory, rules over both of these areas, right? It starts off with the Soviets, this being Soviet territory, and the end, it's Azeris and Armenians fighting over who gets to keep this land. Well, obviously, the tensions were deep between Armenians and Azeris for more than a century, and the Soviet Union had managed to keep that under control one way or another. But I would say that uh, in the early 90s, even if Moscow had withdrawn, there was a sense among Armenians and Azeris that, that Russia was behind everything. And even if it wasn't behind absolutely everything, there was a sense that it did supply, for instance, there was a famous rifle brigade in Nagorno-Karabakh that was accused by Human Rights Watch, actually, of being behind some of the worst massacres. And so I think that the, the idea that Russia completely absented itself would be uh, misleading. Alessia, what do you think? Well, the war actually started, the official war started when Armenia and Azerbaijan already declared uh, their independence. So officially, uh, in 1992, when uh, all this kind of major military activity uh, started, it was the very first months of, of these two countries being independent, sovereign. And it was a kind of a bad idea for them to start with this, you know, because actually, uh, even after the war, everything in these two countries has been built around uh, with Nagorno-Karabakh uh, conflict. And after so many decades, three decades have passed, uh, you can still see how that war and its consequences get reflected in the institutions, in the way people think, consider their lives, you know, and policies. So uh, that was kind of the beginning, and it's still uh, in place, and it still shapes the lives uh, in both countries, I would say. These countries have never been at peace with each other. Well, they were when they were part of uh, empires. Even before being the Soviet Union, they were part of the same empires. 
But as independent states, they never have. So what, when did the war end, Alessa, and what happened since? In 1994, officially, uh, they signed the uh, first uh, ceasefire agreement, then the second one, and uh, basically after that, we do not have any official documents. Uh, so all the attempts to bring peace through political process have been failing one after another. And look, uh, life continues, you know, um, the region is changing, Azerbaijan and Armenia are um, becoming more assertive, Russia, Turkey, Iran, they are kind of changing, you know, as well internally. But the, the conflict is around, and I would say that actually people got used to the fact <laughs> that Nagorno-Karabakh has been there uh, for a long time and will last um, for many more years. So um, I would say that very few are actually making an attempt uh, to kind of bring a major change uh, to Nagorno-Karabakh uh, after so many years and after so many failures uh, in the peace process. So now it looks like things might be changing after almost three decades of impasse. Uh, what's going on? Well, you know, there mm, it has to do with, with uh, major escalation that took uh, place in April 2016. Um, basically, Armenia and Azerbaijan, they were becoming more and more militarized. They would uh, buy a lot of weaponry during the last decade. Often from Russia. I mean, they bought a lot of their weaponry from Russia. <laughs> yeah, the main provider, actually. And you would find exactly the same weaponry pointed it at each other, you know, on Armenian and Azerbaijani side. That has advantages. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's true, but at the same time, what we have been seeing in April 2016, it was kind of the major escalation, and uh, and in just uh, four days of fighting, more than 200 people died. But what is even worse is that after two, April 2016, everyone started talking about the next war. All these conversations, uh, all these kind of debates about the possibility for a peace solution, for a peaceful coexistence, they evaporated just in a moment. And I would meet uh, young people, you know, from Karabakh who would say, oh, I would get married only um, after the next war. And... You know, on the one hand, uh, that was kind of the reality. But on the other, when talking to officials in Baku and Yerevan, I could uh, understand that these guys are actually un realize how much is at stake. And that if there is another war, then there, there would be lots of lots of casualties. That escalation would definitely not be a small scale thing. And that would lead to something major. And that can also question their leaderships. So uh, I would say that they kind of, uh, uh, on the one hand, uh, they could not resist uh, with uh, major radicalization that ha uh, has been around since 2016 escalation. But on the other hand, they were, they were looking for a good pretext, you know, good reason to restart uh, the process. And that good reason was the Armenian revolution when the leadership changed in Yerevan. So you have a change in leadership in Yerevan, and it's the Azeris who see that as an opportunity? Is that what you're telling us? Uh, everyone is kind of cautiously uh, optimistic, I would say. I'm also one of them that on the one hand, uh, you have uh, some people who are starting talking to each other, you would see leaders of Armenia and Azerbaijan coming together, even informally, uh, without any kind of mediators. Uh, they restored communication channels. They haven't spoken to each other directly for more than 15 years. Uh, but on the other hand, the positions uh, have been so much entrenched, especially after the April 2016 escalation, that it's really very difficult to imagine either Armenia or Azerbaijan to go for some major concessions that both are demanding. So uh, on the one hand, uh, there is a kind of a nice environment, uh, but on the other, there is also the reality that uh, nothing has been changing for too long. And it's really very difficult to make a kind of a bold, uh, you know, like something really very big concessions to happen overnight. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group. This is War and Peace, and we're talking to Alessia Vartanyan, Crisis Group's analyst for the EU Eastern Neighborhood, about the war in the Gorna Karabakh, a war as old as independent Armenia and independent Azerbaijan. Alessa, 
the work of crisis group identifies three factors um, that have the two sides remain at odds about and that have precluded resolution of the conflict. So they're the status of Nagorno-Karabakh itself. There's the territories adjacent to Nagorno-Karabakh, which are under Armenian control, but which also were Azerbaijani territory under the Soviet Union. And there's the prospect of some sort of international peacekeeping or observation mission. Can we talk a little bit about what's happened on each of those uh, since 1994 and whether you see any room forward on any of those three issues. Let's start with Karabakh itself. Well, this is a central issue. And the whole conflict is about status of Nagorno-Karabakh. So uh, if uh, you speak to any Armenian in Karabakh, they have no doubts that Karabakh should be independent. Independent, not Armenian. Independent. But, you know, there is this bridge there, <laughs> that after independence, you can start kind of considering who you want to be with. And for Azerbaijan, it is completely non-starter. And no one in the Azerbaijani leadership and very few in the Azerbaijani public will even agree to discuss this issue. Yeah. So for all these uh, years, uh, they have been discussing different formulas, different setups, and some of them considered, considered broad autonomy to Nagorno-Karabakh, uh, which Armenians never agreed with. Some of them also considered interim status, you know, that would eventually finish with referendum that will kind of potentially people will discuss and <laughs> you vote and they, they will agree on the status. So this status issue is something that neither Armenians nor Azerbaijanis can definitely agree on for the moment. So how do you move forward? Well, you know, no one really tried to discuss details, uh, what people mean by independence and what they mean by autonomy. And uh, no one even tried to look uh, what Azerbaijan has to propose. We haven't seen uh, any kind of uh, peace plan, let's say, that Baku could present uh, to the Armenian side telling to Karabakhis, look, this is the autonomy that I, I'm proposing to you. So what we are suggesting in our report, based on interviews uh, with lots of officials uh, in Azerbaijan, is that actually this is the vision and this is the limit of Azerbaijani thinking, current thinking, what uh, Azerbaijan could propose to Karabakhi uh, Armenians uh, for for status. This issue is is uh, not discussed uh, on the Armenian uh, side per se. And what we are saying is that look, uh, if Azerbaijan presents a list of of things, you know, that consider, for example, how administration should happen, how economy should work, how taxation, how your relations with the foreign states uh, should happen, how you should continue your trade with the foreign states. So why don't you get uh, into the discussion? And actually, if you are right, and if you have your truth, try to actually discuss these things and and show what you want to reach, uh, what you want to get in the end. And uh, uh, I think this is the only way. No one ever tried to do that. Uh, and I think this is actually the, uh, a big mistake for both uh, the sides of the conflict and also for the mediators. Alessia, yes, that uh, the independence is a huge conundrum. But the other thing that seems to have changed over time is the whole conceptualization of those those adjacent territories, the seven districts that uh, Armenia currently controls that are, were purely Azerbaijani in Soviet times. Uh, what's changed there? Has there been a population move there? Has there, I remember that in the old days it was always assumed that uh, Armenia would give back these seven territories or districts in return for peace for Nagorno-Karabakh itself. But uh, what's the situation now? How are people thinking about it? You know, Hugh, I think that one of the main problems uh, with all these peace plans that were discussed in the past is that actually they link the territories, the issue of territories to the status. So for all these years, people uh, on the Armenian side, they would think that with uh, lands, with territories is a bargain chip. And uh, they would go back to Baku only in case uh, Baku agrees uh, to the independence of Nagorno-Karabakh. 
Um, I think this is a really vicious cycle uh, because it does not really allow uh, any space for more detailed discussion, including you know, the fate of these territories. Well, if I were a person living in the conflict zone uh, and I know that some new neighbors are to come and live next to me, I would probably need to know how we are to coexist with each other. And yeah, security issues, security concern is the core there. I would say just uh, that actually it's not only about security, but you also need to know how um, the territories are going to be governed, uh, how to basically guarantee the lives there and coexistence between Armenians and Azerbaijanis. It does not matter whether they are to live next to each other on these territories or just uh, between Karabakh, Nagorno-Karabakh itself and the territories. But Alessia, one thing that I, I struck me driving between uh, these territories when I was a reporter in the old days was how empty those districts were. They were just uh, streets of empty houses and uh, and nothing, nobody there. Has that changed? I understand that uh, it has changed. Um, many more people live there, and it was just probably, um, I don't know which years you were there, but I also understand that um, right after the war, there were the people, uh, ethnic Armenians, who had to flee Azerbaijan, Azerbaijani-controlled territories, and uh, the refuge that they found, with, they found it in these territories. So, for example, in Kirbajar or in Lachin district, you can find a lot of people who are actually IDPs themselves. Uh, and uh, they are ethnic Armenian IDPs coming from the Azerbaijani, currently Azerbaijani-controlled territories. In addition to that, there are people coming who came from Armenia itself. You know, Nagorno-Karabakh, I mean, from Russian with Nagorno means mountainous, and this area is mainly about mountains, actually. But all these territories, they are, this is the plain territory, and this is the place where most of agriculture has been happening, even during the Soviet times. In fact, I, I read one debate in, in the beginning of the 20th century uh, when the, the Soviets were discussing the borders of Nagorno-Karabakh itself, and this was one of the main concerns, that actually Armenian-controlled Karabakh was not having enough uh, farming lands. So what happened right after the war, we have Armenian displaced people who came from Azerbaijan itself, from central Azerbaijan, and in addition to that, also ethnic Armenians coming from Armenia itself because they saw free and very good farming lands. And uh, the settlements are not um, huge ones. For Armenians, which is uh, quite a big population, we think that there are around like 70,000 people. If you kind of compare with number to a huge number of Azerbaijani IDPs from these territories, you would say that it's nothing. But the thing is that many of these people have been living in these, uh, uh, in these territories for more than 15 years now. And they think that this is their homeland, and they have cemeteries. They actually invested in, into these places because no one was helping them, uh, you know, to build roads, even to uh, build electricity lines, you know, phone lines to these places. And um, yeah, they have a with great feeling uh, of uh, uh, with huge feeling that this is their land and they should not leave. And uh, I think this is a major problem actually for the peace process. And not one that's acknowledged often. Yeah, it's something that people don't talk about. And, and actually, neither Armenians nor Azerbaijani officials want to speak about this altogether because it's extremely difficult to find very easy solutions. Like, for example, territory is going back within like one year or two years while you're having ethnic Armenian settlements with people who think that this is their land. So you, you will have to go for some difficult uh, conversations, discussing details of how to handle this and how with people, if they decide to stay, then you have to find the ways to acknowledge their interests and rights as well. And if, uh, if they want to leave, then there should be an issue of compensation probably, or at least like someone will have to uh, make sure that with uh, people voluntary also leave this place, you know, and uh, n never come back for fighting. So Alessa, uh, we're almost out of time. So I want to just uh, ask you very quickly to talk about what happens if 
there isn't a peace deal this time around, or if there isn't even, I mean, maybe a peace deal is too much to ask. But what happens if the dialogue breaks down and there isn't any progress? You know, there are many more people saying <laughs> this whole thing, you know, with momentum will fail. To be honest, you know, just uh, because uh, it's really very difficult to imagine um, uh, with um, a process going on, which will take time, you know, and uh, I, I still believe that this is the only way uh, to go forward, uh, because otherwise, uh, if there is no political uh, process, we right away will see uh, deterioration in the conflict zone, people will start getting killed. Uh, and no communication will definitely happen between Baku and Yerevan. And, and with, uh, one of these incidents just can lead to an escalation and probably even to a bigger war. So the only way how you can sustain the current calm in the conflict zone and potentially find a solution to the conflict is actually to get to the substantial negotiations, discussing these three core issues of territory status and uh, peacekeeping. And we didn't even get a chance to talk about peacekeeping and foreign observers, but maybe we'll be able to have that conversation at some point in the future. Alisa, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in to War and Peace. We are all, I think, extremely grateful to Alessa for joining us to make sense of such a complicated situation. If you want to read the new report and some of Crisis Group's past work on Nagorno-Karabakh, do check out our website. The new report is titled Digging Out of Deadlock. We also want to thank our podcast coordinator, Miranda Sonnex, and our producer, Antoine Lereux at Bull Media. I think another place you can look is Crisis Watch, which has followed the Nagorno-Karabakh conflict for 16 years, month by month, incredible wealth of detail and accurate dates and events. Uh, it's all there. Just search our database at Crisis Watch. It really is a fantastic resource. Thanks again, and we'll be talking to you soon. War and Peace, a podcast by the International Crisis Group.